hello everyone today we are going to discuss about how to differential diagnose uh, a inconcomitant squint between either it is a congenital or either it is an acquired or either it is a restrictive or either it is a non restrictive type of incompetent squint so that can be simply done by some of the clinical characteristic as they differ from one another so let's move on and see what are these different clinical characteristics so concomitant versus inconcomitant when we say uh, so incompetent are also called as your paralytic strabismus so the onset of the deviation incompetent are generally seen at a very early age so initially and only periodically it is seen whereas uh, your paralytic squint are the one which can occur at any age and they are sudden in onset so comitant are generally a gradual in nature so they initially start with a phoria and later on they develop as a complete tropia whereas paralytic squint are can be seen at any age and they manifest directly as a paralytic squint they do not have phoria phase when we say the causes so your comitant uh, have causes which can be either hereditary or either it could be uncorrected refractive error or a perinatal injury so uncorrected refractive error as we say uh, we can say refractive accommodative esotropia high refractive error and all these are all your comitant squint whereas your paralytic squints are generally because of the disease or injury to the ocular muscle or the nerves which are supplied uh the innervation to those muscles or the nuclei from where this innervation are generated so paralytic squint will be mostly because of this kind whereas your other causes which are uncorrected hereditary refract uh, hereditary or perinatal injury these are your comitant squint diplopia when we say in comitant squint is not present either your because of suppression or either there is sensory adaptations which are developed like arc and all or either there is an amblyopia which has uh, established in this cases whereas diplopia is very common and present into your paralytic strabismus what happens here that for a good amount or period of life the patient had a single binocular vision or image but the moment there is a paralytic strabismus he starts experiencing a double image because of the unequal correspondence of both the retinas so that is leading to diplopia but it is not seen in comitant because early in the age when such thing happens your brain very really quickly adapts and it can suppress one image or either it can develop an arc so compensatory hesit posture is not required as there is no diplopia in this comitant cases whereas it is constantly present in paralytic strabismus because they have to they are unable to adapt it with the sensory adaptation so they do motor adaptations to uh de decrease the amount of deviation and there is a change in the head posture depth perception will not be present in comitant strabismus because they lack binocular vision uh because of a suppression or the other sensory adaptations but it is present in patient with head posture so if there is no diplopia in the patient at a particular gaze there will be a depth perception present the patient can see the uh, 3d uh, depth uh, perception or rather you can say your different test which are present uh, for assessing the depth perception that can be seen positive here visual equity is usually unilaterally reduced in this cases in comitant in comitant uh, cases what happens that either of the eye one eye is having a higher refractive error or rather a visual anomaly leading to the uh, decreased visual equity whereas in paralytic squint when one one eye is used separately you will find out that there is no change in the visual equity and only the problem is the paralysis of the muscle or the nerve finally coming on to angle of deviation comitant squint have a angle of deviation which is same in all direction of gazes so you will not find any change of uh, angle of deviation in a one particular gaze whereas it will be variable into your paralytic squint and it will increase in the direction where the paralyzed muscle used to action so like again giving an example of your lateral rectus palsy of the right eye 
when you ask the patient to look at the right side the amount of deviation in will increase but when you ask the patient to look on the left side the amount of deviation will decrease so such doesn't happens in your comitant squint in uh, comitant squint what will happen concomitant squint that either you ask the patient to look right or left the amount of deviation will stay same so this is how you generally differentiate between comitant and inconcomitant squint let move on to the second which is your congenital versus the acquired uh, palsies so how do i understand that is it a congenital which is your old paralysis or either it is a acquired or a new paralysis so abnormal head posture when we say that will be persisting even if you cover the paralytic eye so when you cover the paralytic eye the abnormal head posture will not go because now the body has adapted and it knows that whatever be the situation the body has to be into that particular posture to maintain a single vision but if the patient is having a very recent onset of that uh, or acquired palsy so this adaptation has been very recent so the moment you will cover the affected eye that will lead to the normal head posture of the patient back so the patient has not still very much developed with the abnormal head posture so the moment you cover the paralytic eye the head will come into the normal posture diplopia will be not seen into old or congenital cases because over the period of time what happens that the patient will adapt and he will not have much amount of diplopia whereas it will be present into the recent onset or rather acquired palsies amblyopia will be present or uh, maybe not depending on the amount of deviation or how the adaptations have happened but amblyopia will be absent in the patient with acquired palsies so the patient who have recently had a paralytic uh, attack or uh, ocular muscle palsy they will not have amblyopia but if, uh, if it is a congenital palsy the patient will obviously have a presence of amblyopia facial uh, asymmetry if you see it is common with long standing torticollis torticollis is nothing but it is a bending of your neck on one particular side uh, because uh, of your uh, field of uh, diplopia so torticollis uh, that could lead to your facial asymmetry whereas it will be absent into your recent cases comitancy so you can see a spread of comitancy so comitancy means because of a one muscle paralysis the others will also get affected like for example of right lateral rectus palsy uh, the overacting muscle of right medial rectus will start happening and uh, because uh, sorry the left medial rectus will start overacting and as already the right eye is into a convergent position your uh, right medial rectus need not any further innervation to converge so it will not oh, act properly and it will go into a uh, underacting phase and because of which your right uh, sorry left lateral rectus will go into a secondary palsy so that is what is called as a spread of comitancy or a muscle sequelae whereas in patients with uh, recent or acquired uh, palsy you will see that it is incompetent squint and other muscles are working fine properly past pointing will be absent in congenital or old cases but it will be present into your recent cases abnormal uh, head posture uh, may persist on covering as i already discussed it uh, forced duction test again forced duction test uh, is a test which is used to differentiate your congenital and acquired palsies so it will be positive in cases of congenital whereas it will be negative in cases of recent or acquired palsies uh, so you can also see the abnormal head posture will be present in old photographs if the patient is having a congenital paralysis of any ocular muscle but it will be absent in old photographs of the recent or acquired patients onset of the symptom usually indefinite and intermittent the patient will say that he doesn't know that when did it actually started and it happens on and off but the patient with recent or acquired palsies will say a definite time and a definite uh, particular period when it happened and how it happened they will say it was sudden 
so they will say one day i woke up and suddenly i saw everything double and i couldn't move my right eye on to particular side so that is generally in acquired whereas in congenital they might say that it is since uh, birth which i am seeing that one of my eye is outward and it started gradually that i having diplopia into one side and it is since long time so that is how you differentiate your congenital and acquired palsies so there are some tests which are generally done to find out if it is a paralytic or a restrictive squint so there is a difference between paralytic and restrictive paralytic means that one muscle is not functioning and restrictive means that the muscle is being restricted from functioning because of some obstruction so there are two types of uh, test this is generally a force duction test which is being done here we have a video ahead that will show you how it is actually done so there is one passive and then when uh, there is an active uh, kind of your duction test so passive means you hold the globe and you move it in both the directions to see if the globe is moving freely so if it is moving freely that means the force duction test uh, shows that it is a paralytic squint and not a restrictive squint and also you ask the patient to you take it away from the globe and you ask the patient to take the eye onto the other side and see if the you can feel the muscle force so if you feel a muscle force that means that the muscle is actually having a good amount of strength and it is not paralyzed so this is how you generally do this test so this is a test how it is done please see to it routinely perform force duction tests before every strabismus procedure here the limbus is being gripped with St. Martin's forceps. The globe moved anteriorly to put the rectus muscles on stretch and the eye moved into adduction, abduction, elevation and so then So here what has happened, so if in you see case, there was the no eye has been grasped and it has uh, moved freely in all the direction of gazes when to see if there is any restriction present or not so if you don't feel find any restriction that means it is because of the paralysis of the nerves and that is what is telling you that it is a paralytic squint and not a restrictive squint so this is what is force duction test in which you grasp the globe and you move it in different direction to see if the eye can move so next the is your exaggerated traction test so in this test what happens stretch. You can then uh, generally have uh, traction done on to it. So you the move the globe the into one particular the uh, superior position, it and you see the if the superior tendon actually moves on to it or not. So next test is spring back balance test. So spring back balance test is nothing but uh, you take you grasp the globe with a tweezer and you move it through and fro and you leave it to see if the eye goes into a primary position or it comes into one particular position so if there is any restriction present which is not allowing the globe to grow freely so the eye will go into that particular restricted position and that will give you an idea that the patient is having a restriction of a muscle to move it freely and it is not a paralytic squint and it is a restrictive squint next test is your active force generation test so in this what we do is with the help of this tweezer we will hold the globe of the patient move it in one direction and ask the patient to move the eye in other direction to see if there is muscle force present or not so in this see if, if you see you take the globe in the opposite direction and ask the patient to move the eye down to the right hand side or the left hand side so if this test in this test if we assess that does the patient actually has a paralysis or not or is there a restriction so if you see uh, I'm testing here the medial rectus let's say if this is the nose in this side so the moment I ask the patient to look on this side that means the medial rectus is functioning properly or let's say if it is the lateral rectus I ask the patient to look on this side and the lateral rectus is functioning properly so there is no paralysis of this muscle and you can do it in all the direction of gazes so to see if which muscle is actually paralytic or is there a restriction present there is also uh, changes in the lid fissure or if you can see the palpebral fissure height 
so if there is any restriction present there will be a change into the lid fissure or rather the palpebral fissure so this is a case of your uh, Duane's retraction retraction syndrome so here what is happening there is uh, the eye eyeball or the globe will be retracted whenever the patient tries to adduct or abduct so if you see in primary position both the uh, palpebral fissure are almost same but the moment you ask the patient to look in one particular direction so in this case the patient whenever he looks he has a lesser amount of palpebral fissure height which is indicating that it is a restrictive squint because in paralysis there will be no change of your palpebral fissure height but whenever there is a restriction there will be always a change in palpebral fissure height so i hope you understood uh, how to differentially diagnose a paralytic and a restrictive squint and difference between a congenital and an acquired and also committent and incompetent squint do subscribe our channel for more videos on binocular vision and squint and also topics on optometry thankful for your uh, patient listening and uh, I hope to see you soon back onto the new videos. Goodbye.